Oh, I already yo, did. Yo, yo, yo. Yeah, I already did the audio check. My, uh, my scale approach might be very different from your previous guest, just so you know. I lean more on people than so much strategies. You know what I'm saying? Hey, hey, just dude. so you know. Yeah, that's, oh, that's the, kind of the point. Well, that, yeah. that's, that's actually something that I... Bro, I, I, I know you so well, bro. <laughs> my name is Anthony. Welcome to the Scalability Podcast. Oh, my God. That... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you so I I, I used dude. to be in this fool in his apartment when it was like in downtown City Hall, bro. He was in the hood. He was in the hood. Hey, let's hold on. Are he was we in the trenches. You gave me my first book, the Gary Vee book. Yeah, I remember that. Oh. Yeah, I remember that, bro. What, that, that, Angel was just a kid. He was just a, a younger. Hella younger. Small. Yeah. Tiny. It's it's been a minute, guys. So yeah. for for those of you who don't know yet, let me introduce you to BQ. Mm. Uh last time I was on his podcast, it was the Mentor Monday se- segment yep. of of your podcast, which yep. thank you for having me on. Hell yeah. And uh it's been a minute now and I'm actually glad that it's been a minute because I think from the time that like you you just keep growing like you 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 keep having like growth spurts like every like 6 to 6 months to a year, dude. It's like you have something new or something bigger, better, badder going on. Yeah, I try, man. Shit, I got. Uh, I feel like my mind moves so like, like fast sometimes as far as creatively. Yeah. And uh, I want to do so many things in my life. You know what I mean? But I don't believe in um, the way traditional approaches are. Like everyone thinks you got to go to school and yeah. you know get a career and then make enough money, get kids, retire, and then do mm-hmm. all these things. But like my mind has always been programmed like that since young. You know what I mean? I, I dropped out of college and stuff like that. Dealt with a lot of criticism for that, and yeah. started a business at 19. And everyone and, and you also criticized d- me that. But the thing is, that. you did it too at a time where it wasn't very popular. Like for it, sure, it was like for it sure. was barely becoming like a thing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, because there was still like a big ass stigma around that time. Right? Oh, like I, yeah. I, I felt like no we doubt. we we were at the end of like. You know, it's probably like our generation because we're only a couple years apart, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's like our generation that finally like made the transition for everybody. Where now it's cool to be an entrepreneur, even though it's, it's yeah. really fucking not. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe but, on the gram, TikTok, yeah, yeah, maybe. on the gram and on TikTok, exactly. But um, but you know, like, cause for example, like your parents or our parents, yeah. like if they tried to follow the same model as us, they would have, you know, gotten shat all over, right? Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, with, with that being said, guys, so if, um, I've been following BQ for the longest since he was selling cell phones out the mall. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think uh, I think as an entrepreneur, would you would you say that that's like your base skill, right? Like every 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 entrepreneur has like a base skill. Like I'll give you examples. So you have like tech entrepreneurs who their base skill is like technology, right? Yeah. Uh, you have operations people who are extremely good at operations. Yeah. Uh, you, then you have like marketers who are, they're extremely good at marketing. And then you got sales people who can close sales. And um, and you have like art artists, you mm-hmm. know, people who lead with their art, right? Yeah. So um, would you say like the sales is your base? Yeah, I would say sales slash business development. That's like my prime focus right now. I mean, it's always been like that. I've always been selling hats in middle school. I used to sell phones at the mall. I used to work at Verizon. Uh, I transitioned into tech sales. So it's always been sales. What's the difference between sales and business development? Sales is like as simple as a transaction, like selling a Topo Chico bottle to the homie for a dollar. And then business development is more like a, a full cycle. Like it could be a deal that could take weeks, months. (laughs) <laughs> long-term transaction yeah and i like that description and you know i i i feel uh i feel very lucky that i i feel like i kind of got to witness uh like you closing paypal oh <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> yeah that was uh that was wild yeah there was the, I, I i was talking to a lot of people about that because it was my first time negotiating something that big with a company with a very big name in the tech world i mean one um, of the biggest yeah exactly one of the biggest and um related to something connected to the culture right right so it was a big deal and i had to get everyone's input um that's a lot of people yeah like three four or five different people like how should i navigate this what are some things i should be aware of how um what are, what are some of the verbiage of the discussion that I, it should be mentioned mm-hmm. um but it it was definitely historical yeah i mean like i don't talk about the business side of the history of culture and i market yep. but that definitely is a milestone and by sure. the way like you know for those of you who follow bq you guys are going to get to here today shit that you would not normally hear on his podcast or any of his content and i feel like to you know for anybody who's listening to this who can't, who took their time to come over here you're gonna you deserve to get this game because 
Um, I can tell you right now, like, I, I think my perception, especially within the artist industry, um, you know, when it comes to art and business, a lot of times there's, there's, it, it's just not a good mix sometimes. Like you, you get, you see like uh, record labels and artists, like, you know, don't, don't trust each other yeah. because, you know, the, it seems like nowadays every, you know, when you see record labels on social media, it's them screwing the artists, these yeah. 360 deals and contracts that were made for a time when there was no digital, um, you know, digital distribution, stuff like mm -hmm. that, right? So how have you navigated that, um, you know, while building Culture Night Market? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Like what exactly? Yeah, so the question would, uh, the question would be, how, how does an entrepreneur like you exist in such a delicate space, mm. like, you know, like yeah. culture, like yeah. art, right? So I think um, the whole thing was like being aware of where I was at. Like in San Jose, there wasn't a lot of businesses in culture, right? Mm -hmm. And there was, it was more prioritizing like fashion, mm -hmm. uh, maybe like sneaker stores, um, but you didn't really see a lot of like um, creative, urban creative uh, culture businesses, yeah. you know what I mean? There definitely was art businesses yeah. in local 501c3s, but when it came to like hip hop specifically, I didn't really see a lot of it. So I was always like traveling to different places like LA, uh, Vegas, Arizona, because at the, at the time I was selling uh, streetwear fashion and that's where it all kind of started, right? Selling clothes, right? I love I love streetwear fashion. Yeah, I remember this fool used to like put up his little pop-up shop and I would just think like, this, <laughs> fool, this was fucking crazy. He's just selling clothes to- Anywhere, <laughs> anywhere, bro. In the beginning, yeah. I was I set up in front of your uh, your brother's barbershop. That was one of my first pop-ups right, in Evergreen uh, Barbershop. And then eventually we did, because before that, I only did the flea markets. I did Capital, I did Berryessa, I did Oakland. That's where I, I actually started it. And that's actually was, was it put in my mind for one of my mentors, uh, Frankie Santiago, he uh, had a company that sold bed sheets, and he would only go to the flea markets. And he and I was like, kind of making fun. Of him. I was like, bro, why are you over here selling bed sheets at the flea market, right? But he's like, champ, I make four thousand dollars a weekend. Like, what do you mean? Yeah. And I'm like, how are you doing that? He's like, you gotta realize every day there's people here. Like, you can go to the mall, maybe you can f find a cheap, you know, find a cheap kiosk at Westgate Mall, for example but you're not gonna get the traffic you're gonna get here at the, at the place. And everyone's always looking for a good deal. Yeah. And he was just explaining to me how he was able to get revenue every day. Yeah. He's like, you need to come in the mindset of how to make money every single day. And I was like, okay. So then him putting that in my mind, I translated that with clothes. I was like, all right, I'm gonna just go. And that's when I dropped out of school. So then I started doing pop-ups at the flea market on the weekends. And then the school I dropped out of, which is at De Anza, highest administrative students in all of California, um, I would set up a pop-up on campus on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I would see my old classmates. I would see my old professors. And it was a weird time because, like like I said, this was a stigma. You didn't really see a lot of entrepreneurs. And, and to the level and the extreme version that I was approaching it, like doing it every day. Yeah, and, and there's probably, like, a lot of people looking down on you at For that sure. time, right? I, like, oh. Chris. I still do to this day. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it all makes sense in the long run. But in that moment, it was it was a lot of tough skin that I had to have. And I think Sprint ha allowed me to do that, you know? Well, I, I think, you know, you know, I just, I think I kind of just thought of, like, an answer to uh, to the original question, too, right? Like, how do you, how are you able to exist in here? It's, it's because, you know, you know what? you're you're not a culture vulture you you've never been fake about this you've mm -hmm. always you've always loved the culture you've always loved hip hop i've yeah. i i i'm surprised you don't have a fucking baseball cap on today bro, or, or <laughs> i was going to put mine on right now but i just got my hair cut so i was like i might just rock the cut yeah, yeah i i swear like you you've always you've always that's always just been you and you've never yeah. changed right it, to answer your question sorry i was going off subject but yeah. i think it's really just like having passion for it and just loving it and then always knowing at the end of it all you're going to find a way to make it work so my heart is in it and i feel like that's the reason why i found a way to make it make sense and it took years like it took literally seven years to find a way to make income out of it like i made little flips here and there with the mm -hmm. clothes that was really the only tangible income i was making was through yeah. the clothes but then i found a way to like get sponsorships and then like do production work and then do uh you know clients uh services like it all kind of fell in line long term long run in the long run mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but yeah that's that's what i would say to answer that question got it so now coming into um okay so you know just if we could if we could just real quick like if you were to give advice to somebody who's looking to close a deal like paypal or google or something yeah. like that if you were just to make it like three tips on how to close one of the giants 
I think it's first is figuring out what their interest is, like what is their connection to you, for example. Uh, like I think with PayPal, they had a campaign called Support Our City, which was based about supporting small businesses. And Culture Night Market was already in alignment with supporting small businesses. We literally are designed to help small businesses. Yeah. So the fact that I knew that that was one of their main initiatives that they had rolled out publicly on their websites Boom. and everything. So to amp to make it smaller is like do research, like figure out what their interests are, what they're trying to do. Um, so then you can find how you can align yourself with that initiative and then bring value. Did you just apply and then cross no, your fingers? No, no. It basically, it started <laughs> from a cold call um, because I was really ambitious and I was just like, let me just cold call them just to see how much it costs. There's, there's a million people at PayPal. Who the fuck do you cold call? So I went on Google and I typed uh, PayPal Park and I said book venue and then I found a link and I found a number. I found an email, I sent an email, and then there was a number number on the signature. I called the a number, and I got in contact with someone that works in the marketing department, and I said, hey, this is what I do, this is Culture Night Market, and they were like, yeah, he's, and I was, basically, they didn't even give me a price, because they kind of knew already that I couldn't afford it, but then I asked them, I was like, hey, just, just out of curiosity, like, how much does it cost to book it if I want to do an event there? And they're like, oh, 10, 15 grand, and at that time, I had no, you know, uh, I had no amount of money, like, in that realm, so I was yeah. like, okay. Um, but the fact that I asked that, she was like, you know what, um, this may align with some of our initiatives because we are doing something, this is what I'm talking about, the Support Our City campaign. She was like, let me put you in contact with someone because there may be a way to, to see how we can help you. And then, it, and then from there, one email follow up to another. Then I had a meeting with Rahan. I'm sorry, not Rahan. Um, damn, it's going to kill me if I don't remember his name. Um, damn. I'm going Slip to help your okay. There's this guy that um, he was really cool. Oh, Rahul. Yeah, there you go. Rahul. Rahul. Really, he's a big reason why that deal happened because he was really, he's from Portland, but he lived in San Jose for a lot of years, and he really fucked with us. He loved our movement. He loved our energy, and he was like, I want to make this happen for you. Like, I really like what you're doing. Um, let me see how I can try to push this to our executives to see if they can support it. So, so you found a champion yeah. within PayPal to go to bat for you. It was the earthquakes, technically, because the earthquakes and oh. PayPal are hand in hand. Okay. They're two separate entities, but PayPal, you know, they're now the owners of that park, and they help the earthquakes kind of, you know, take off and promote their events because they're all kind of two they, entities they, they, that support they bankroll each other. Them. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, he was a big reason because it took the earthquakes. I had to convince the earthquakes first before I even got to PayPal. Okay. So basically, I went through two different pipelines. Wow. You know what I mean? So. Uh, and then Rahul, from Rahul, I met the executives, and then I got connected with Gordon Kane, who's their uh, main director at the park, and he's the one that makes the decisions on what happens and what doesn't happen, and he ended up really liking everything we stood for and what we did. I had, I put hours of work with my team uh, on like a proposal and all the details of our event. I had a Zoom call where I'm on their main TV screen, and they're in a conference room, and there's like four or five people in, in the executives from the earthquake sitting down watching me on the TV screen at their office, and I'm over here like, like passionate just going in on like why we're doing it see you know you know what's interesting about that there's people who are watching this right now who are probably still working the cell phone job they're probably working a job making calls they're probably selling cars they're probably like doing sales and dude you know in the moment sales you know obviously getting a sale feels good but like the work to get a sale fucking sucks like yeah it's, it, it's it's shitty so there's people right now who like you you need to understand that like a lot of it's, it's like fucking uh you know mr miyagi wax on wax off wax yeah. on wax off right and that's what your cold calls are right now it's it's mr miyagi right because you don't understand that one of these days you're going to be like in a situation like bq and that skill is going to help you pick up the most people cannot pick up a phone and fucking make a call worth a shit. Yeah. Like, they're, they're too scared. They get anxiety, yeah. whatever. Yeah. You, you, and when you do this on a daily basis, you don't understand how valuable that skill set is, like, until you're in a position like yourself where yep. you, you, bro, it takes balls to ask that question. For how, sure. How, bro, like, it, sometimes I get intimidated going in, bro, like, I know I can afford something, yeah. you know, and I get intimidated asking for prices sometimes. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I feel, sometimes I even feel stupid. Like, yeah. like when going into a watch store <laughs> yeah. and, and just like, oh, damn, how much does that watch cost? I know I probably can't afford that shit, yeah. but how much does it cost anyway? Like, so for you to call PayPal and get that information, bro, is fucking awesome. And obviously, like, there was a lot of steps in between, right? So yeah. for the sake of, like, sticking to the to the bullet points, so, yeah. no, so number one, do your research. You yeah. found out PayPal aligned with what you guys were doing. Yeah. Number two. Uh, bring value, you know, and explain how 
their what what you've researched and what you see that they have that is in alignment with you find a way to connect yourself to that and i think that's what we did in that in that essence um and three is just be passionate i think that's the biggest key in everything that we've done is just be be real about it, you know what I mean? And if you can't, if you don't feel that shit, find someone on your team that can do that, you know, you know what I mean? And that's another thing we'll talk about after is just team and, and getting them involved with that process, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we can segue right into it because if there's, you know, to me, if, if you had, you know, if you were a superhero, one of your superpowers is, uh, you know, your ability to passionately recruit teams. Right, passionately recruit and motivate them, mm -hmm. because you know I, I love I love what you do, right? Like you you've always, you know, and, and at the beginning, uh, at the beginning, it's like, you know, when people can't see anything, when they can't see the space, when they yeah. can't see the events, you know, like you've always been very very good at like articulating what the future could be, and you've never yeah. lied, mm -hmm. because look at look at this what it, what yep. it is here. Like yep. there's there's probably some people who like because even I I've done this before where like. Yeah. I recruit someone at the beginning of my business and I'm like, guys, mm -hmm. it's going to be a multi-million dollar business. You know, we're going to, it's going to be big and like, yeah. you know, they stick around for like three months and nothing happens and yeah. they're like. <laughs> you know what that's called? It's called the art of vision. I believe in that. That's what I say on my podcast is the art of vision is like being able to explain, articulate and show people, give them that illustration of what the future can look like. And that's hard for some people. You know what I mean? Like people sometimes don't have that ability to like, to see that in their mind. And then the most challenging part is making that into a reality, which is literally the hardest part, right? And there's people out there that do that. That's what makes humans the smartest creatures in this world, bro. We, we make, we like everything you see in this room is created from someone's mind, bro. Yeah. It all started here, you know what I'm saying? So I, that's how I feel like I view everything that we do is just like, if I can see it in my mind, I can, it's possible to make it in real life. You know, you know what was created? by someone's mind <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> that good old Florida de Caña, that yeah. good rum so, so uh, before we keep going guys so if you guys don't know this already uh, one of the reasons why uh, BQ is. and I connect uh, pretty deeply is because we're both Nicaraguense. Uh, so I yeah. brought you a gift today. Hell yeah, <laughs> appreciate you, bro. I was gonna go on my, my bottle collection right here. Yeah, and you know this is uh, th this bottle here is not one of like the more expensive ones, but you know what, bro? Hey, uh, it's classic though. Yeah, Florida de Caña is Florida de Caña, and um, so yeah, that's that's one thing where uh, both of our families come from Nicaragua. Um, and I think like it's, it's really interesting, bro. Because you know I've been seeing more Nicaraguan people popping out of nowhere. Hell yeah! Like it's about time, man. Yeah, yeah get yeah. out there. Exactly. Show the culture. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, man. Uh, take that. Enjoy. You want to appreciate it that? Yeah, we'll put it right now. Yeah, bro. Thank you. Put that um, so coming back to uh, you know coming back to recruitment, right? So let's say that like let's say someone is like you. They have. A vision and it, whether it's a culture night market or an outdoors plug or whatever type of business right yeah um i think if i had your skill set to recruit because I'm, I'm nowhere near as a good as good a recruiter as you are mm. let me just fucking put that out there mm. okay i've like I, I i'm nowhere as near a, a recruiter as you are so um, let's say that someone's trying to start something i know for a fact that if you're good at recruiting you can get further faster yeah. And at the beginning of a business, less expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, even for me now, like, some of the... I have people that, like, you know, in the Philippines, I have one girl who, when she started with me, she was making $200 a month, yeah. right? She's making $2,000 a month, nice. which I know for the U.S. people, like, that's not a lot. Yeah. But, boy, she's fucking balling. Yeah. She bought a Hell luxury yeah. condo. She bought a brand new car. Hell yeah. She fucking... Most successful person her entire family's ever seen. Yeah. So, and, you're, and you're also changing the stigma of capitalism right there, too, because a lot of people think it's unethical when you outsource internationally. Sure. But the fact that you're actually giving them, like, beyond livable wages in a country that doesn't provide that consistently, that's actually yeah. a good thing on your part yeah. because you're changing that stigma. You know what I'm saying? I believe in conscious capitalism. That's why I'm big Conscious on capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I've never, like, used that term, but I don't like to screw people over, and I like people to make money and feel good while they do it. Operate I mean? out of a good place, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, LaRussell says that shit. He's like, he's like, if you, the way you do business is the way, uh, that it's a representation of you. Like, some mm. people say, like, it's just business, but, like, nah, it's, it's, it's really a representation of who you are as a person. You know what I mean? If you're willing to fuck someone over to put yourself on, that's that, you're a nasty person, you yeah. know what I mean? But if I can build a business and help another person uh, get further in life that's a win-win for both of us and it feels good to do that yeah dude and i love that bro like i and i've just like you know i've always been that way even if i've like been in a really rough spot you know like uh for example 
I can't, I can't sleep at night knowing that I'm screwing somebody over. Hell no. I, I, can't, I can't function Integrity that way. Integrity is everything. So, um, so, come, so let's come back to recruiting. Yeah. Give, give, give some game on like, okay, especially for like these newer entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right? Like what, what should they be thinking about when they're recruiting? Should they, you know, just be selling everybody on their vision and become the fucking church of Scientology? or what, what, what? <laughs> There's a lot of elements to it, but I'm going to just say, I'm going to quote Rex Live Raj. He's like, it's better to lead by demonstration. So like showing people what it looks like to do the work and then guide the process and then show them how it, and then give them an opportunity to do that process with you and then let them go and do it on their own. So it's like four steps, but it's really just like you doing it, you walking through someone doing it, giving giving them the chance to do it, and then letting them run the operation. How do you? But that's like a long term process. That's not like every like one day and the next day they're they're taking over. How do you find these people? Uh, how'd, the, you, how'd you find Blanco? How'd I was gonna you, say. How'd you guys meet? I, I'm, I'm so curious because because so at the beginning I, I didn't see you around like at the very beginning. Yeah. And then I think I think I, the first time and I'm pointing at Blanco because he's yeah. in the back. Yeah, uh, Blanco. Uh, so so I, I first met him. I think it was the uh, uh, the night that or the day that we went to PayPal. You were recording, right? No, 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 no. That was somebody else. I can't remember the first day I met you, but like. Since I met you, you're here all the time. Wasn't it Mentor Monday, right? It was yeah. Mentor Monday. Was it Mentor Monday? Yeah, okay, Mentor yeah. Monday. Yeah, so uh, he's a great example. So Blanco, he literally, we met on August of this past year, uh, this year, and uh, it was right before San Jose Jazz, one of our biggest events. And um, I, I think his brother was a vendor at uh, uh, Genius Apparel. He was a vendor at one of our events Oh, before. that's your brother? Yeah, I oh, yeah, bought, he bought, bought a jacket. Yeah, yeah, I bought a jacket from him. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. He, his brother was a vendor with us, and his brother spoke highly of me and told him, like, hey, you should connect with BQ. He's kind of doing similar stuff to what you're interested in because Blanco has a background in, like, marketing. He's been a part of the culture. He's been an artist. He's done audio engineering. He has a very diverse uh, skill set, and it's really, it really in alignment with everything I'm doing with Emlyn. So I didn't know that right away. He was just trying to hit me up, and it was crazy because like I was hella, I didn't, I don't have my notifications on. So he actually came to the office, and I missed him. And I was like, fuck. He's like, I already left, bro. And I was like, damn. I was like, shit. Slide, slide through next time. So he ended up coming back the next day, and then right away, like when we started talking, I just kind of sensed that he really was about that action, like yeah. as far as like what his interests were, what he cared about. Um, as far as his um, appreciation for music and hip hop and all that, that's what I gravitate to first and foremost. Is like people that are on that same frequency. It's like you've we probably you've probably been in a situation where someone is in the business world, right? And then you come across them, and then they navigate business a little bit differently than how you do. And maybe you don't have anything against them the way they do it, but you you don't you don't you don't click with it. You know what I mean? It's just they they do it differently. Yep. So that's what I really look for in people when I recruit. Bro, that, wait, how you just described it, that happens to me all the time. Yeah, so like yeah. I have to I have to feel good about who I'm working with. And that's one of the first things I look for is like just the energy, right? And I think our energy was really like connected. So it just started simple stuff like just having them come around and just come check out the spot, um, you know, come work out of here and then doing some video stuff. And then San Jose Jazz happened. Keep in mind, he was on the Amlin side. Like he was like, hey, I'll help out with some Amlin stuff. He, I don't think he knew I was doing culture night market, and then later I was telling him, like, hey, I got this big event. I need some people to come help out if you want to come support. The crazy thing about that situation is that we were working with San Jose Jazz, and they have this big-ass truck. It's called the Boombox truck, and it's mm. basically a digital projected sound. Like It has an iPad built into it, has the, the speakers, everything you need to do a show. Mm. You could just drive the truck and, and park, and it's like a show. It's a <laughs> oh, stage, okay. so it's hard. <laughs> yeah. But our team, uh, you know, uh, Crazy G Live and Paco, my other team members, they're used to like um, wires and old school setup, you know what I mean? So when we did that event, it was a big deal. And then not realizing that we didn't have experience doing digital sound. So mm. we were like, fuck, we're kind of like a little pickle. Blanco thankfully saved the day that day and he managed the audios on that, that day of that event. His first basically experience with us on a big level was one of our biggest events and he like came through for the day. You know what I'm wow. saying? So that's a, that's a story that people don't know about, but he, he saved that day. Well, shout out mean? to Blanco. Yeah, shout out Blanco <laughs> for sure. So that's what I'm saying. Like, so, go ahead. so ultimately you guys kind of attracted each other in that way. Like, yeah. so, but okay. Now let's, let's go even like further back. Yeah. Right. Because right now, so, you know, obviously your, your vision is more clear now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Somebody, yeah. so, somebody can walk in here and, and see like, Oh, there's actually something going on. Yeah. You, mm -hmm. you you know, there's a whole there's a whole ass office. Yeah. There's a whole ass event. You got trucks, you got stages, you got lights, you got yeah. you, you know, you got everything now. Yeah. But how how did you attract talent before you had all that? 
leading by demonstration, man. Like it was just me doing the podcast by myself. I'll set up the iPhones. I'll do the video work. People just saw me doing the work. How man. about like let's go to Culture Night Market though? Right? Culture Night Market. I mean, that one was only like two, three people: uh, Patron and Andy, myself, um, and that was really it. Like it was just us three because um, that was during the pandemic. So basically, all we were focusing on was helping people because I was doing my media stuff down here. But Patron and Andy, they were tapped in with all of downtown. Keep in mind, I'm like a tourist in downtown. I'm from the south side, you know what I mean? So I'm not really over here that often um, until I decided to get an office space down here. So when the pandemic happened, I witnessed downtown turn into a ghost town. Like I saw people lose their jobs. I saw people lost their storefronts. I saw uh, property owners struggling to maintain their, their infrastructure. And one of the people specifically, her name is Sunny. She owns the parking lot right behind the grad, which is right across the street from here. Um, the, she was one the of the $10 only, parking lot. Yep. The, her. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so no, she, that lady, bro. Hold on. That lady's so nice. Yeah. She's her, so she, nice. Her, her and her kids. Yeah. They're, they're all, they're all, yeah, really nice. all them, yeah, yeah. They're, they're amazing, uh, amazing family. And, uh, yeah. I'm really close with them now, but in the beginning I didn't know who they were. Um, and she's one of the only minorities that own property in downtown. That's another thing I want to highlight. Cause a lot of these buildings are owned by big development companies and stuff like that. So that's a huge accomplishment for her. So shout out to her. And uh, so at that time, she was struggling to maintain tenants that were paying rent for the monthly passes. But since everyone started working remotely, there was less people paying for the spots. And that was just like on Sundays or Saturdays when people were around, Monday through Friday was kind of dry. Um, and Andy Patron knew a lot of people in downtown. They introduced me to people. They started telling me what was happening. And then I thought to myself, why don't we do an event? Why don't we do like a, a marketplace? Like, because in my head, I'm like, I used to be a vendor for four or five years. That helped me make like 500 bucks, a thousand bucks in a weekend. Like I see a lot of people starting a food business, starting a clothing uh, brand, starting uh, accessory company, cultural stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was really empowering, you know what I mean? It motivated me because I'm like, damn, like they're doing the shit that I was doing. And now it's like people are coming together to do it. I had never seen San Jose do that before you know what i mean so and they were doing illegal they're like fuck i'm gonna park at the park a lot i'm gonna go to the park but i'm like they got the right mindset but the thing that's missing is a concentrated space that's focused on that you know what mm -hmm. i mean so i approached sunny uh through andy and patron and they were like let's do an event i proposed it to her i said look if you let us do the event here um, we will give you a profit split of what we make so that way you make money for the space and we can help these vendors at the same time First event, it was only 200 people. Second event, it was like 300. Fast forward to the fifth one, it was at 500, which is a big deal because it was like, I've never put that many people together before. Yeah. And that was in the parking lot, bro. And then it was insane because it was a movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it felt so good to know that people were making money um, and seeing them make it. Like, there was people making some serious cheese, man. Like, they were walking out with at least 500, 800 bucks, maybe even 1,000. And for some people, that they might view that as like nothing, but for <laughs> others, that's like, that's everything that, that, that's especially uh, when people didn't have bro this is the pandemic bro people were were literally scared they were like living inside their houses people had their masks you know what i'm saying like people didn't know what to expect so the fact that we gave well, an option the reality of this market yeah in the south bay area yeah and other markets like it like san francisco new york yeah the reality is that there's people that are here yeah who after everything is paid, probably have 200, 300 bucks. Yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's their money to eat out. That's their yeah. money to buy. Like, you know what I mean? Like if, or if they're like two, 300 bucks shy, they're fucked. So like we, we live in that market right now where unfortunately that's the norm. Mm -hmm. So for you to be able to put something here where yeah, a thousand bucks doesn't sound like a lot. Motherfucker. Yeah. Hell no. Nah. That, that's, that, that, you're, you're, that's, that's saving fucking you know, that, that could be paying for somebody's rent or that could be paying for somebody's food or medicine yeah. or, you know what I mean? So, nah, bro. Yeah. I, and it was interesting time, bro. Like, there was people that were, like, emotional, like, thanking us. Like, thank you for doing this because they we didn't have this a week ago yeah. type shit. And the city, you know, the city was getting calls from other organizers that <coughs> we weren't supposed to be doing that. They were snitching on us. They were like, why are you doing this? This isn't that. <laughs> Threatening to find us and shit like that. Um, and then at the end of it, I was just kind of like worried because I'm like, damn, like I feel good about doing this, but at the end of it all, I'm I'm the one that's gonna get fucked, you know what I mean? If, if I decide to continue, so yeah. I was scared for a little bit. I ain't gonna lie. So I stopped the event for about four months, mm -hmm. and then then I started noticing other pop-ups start, started coming around. Copying, but, it. but they, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say copying because I don't feel like we're 
creating the wheel here. It's not like these markets don't exist across the United States. Okay. But cool. I think it was just that um, what, what gave me a bad taste in my mouth was that they weren't getting the same repercussions that we were. Like the city wasn't telling them anything. They didn't even care. They were actually going to the events and supporting it. So I was just like, it was such a double standard. But I realized that it was really because an organizer specifically was calling and since they have a, a relationship with the city they had an obligation to say something so with that being said that motivated me to be like all right you know what if this is what they think that is going to stop me then bet i'm going to start calling them and be like hey what's the permit process how much does it cost what are the department what are the county restrictions like i need to know all this stuff i started pressing them because i believe in nipsey hustle man his whole term stay dangerous so i was like i felt dangerous at that time i was like I got I to gotta play offense, you know what I mean? So I said, fuck it, I'm going to start calling them, asking all these questions. And then they were kind of like, they didn't expect that from me, you know what I mean? And then I started mm -hmm. actually doing everything, and then I found out it was hella expensive. Very expensive to do shit in Santa Clara County. I must throw that out there. Literally one of the most strictest counties in all of California. It is the strictest. So the fact that we were able to um, not only figure all that out, but take that chance, because we fundraise like 2K uh, doing the events. Keep in mind, it, that was only half of what it cost. So I said, fuck it. I said, we take that chance. We increase the fees a little bit and we, we lean on our community to support us in hopes that we can maintain this. Yeah. So we took that chance and we actually fell short like 500 bucks after doing everything. But that was such a good sign to me because I was like, dude, like that number felt so unrealistic and we were only 500 bucks away. Yeah. I said, we run it back again and then again. <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm like, damn, we're fucking like, we're really doing it legit now. And now the city of San Jose and OCA and all them, they love us. They talk, they talk about us like a testimonial. They're like, these guys like they started like this. Yeah, and well, now I just I just bumped into you at another event downtown and then you had just left an event yeah. where the mayor was talking or something like that. Uh, or? the Carabiner event. It was an okay. improv. Who, yeah. Okay, who was talking about y'all? Oh, man, there was a... Cause then I must have misheard. <laughs> Sorry, who was it? There was a so uh, Eric Glader. He's uh he's uh he he's the one that runs the UVI, which is like a a nonprofit. But they they they're the ones that put all that together and the block party. Okay. They spoke about us, and then also another development company that's really big out here um, spoke about us as well. So it was really interesting to see that we were. They didn't even know we were in the room, and yeah. they were like, "Oh, you know, we want to bring downtown to life and." And we want to bring like culture night markets, and I was like, damn, that was kind of like a, that was kind of like a oh shit moment type shit, because we were just like, they don't even know that we're in here and they're speaking about us, you know what I mean? It's it's interesting because you know you know what cult, it sounds like culture night markets gonna turn into, um, you know, a, uh, go give me a uh, un pamper, <laughs> like pamper is a brand. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Facts. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, like cornflakes. My mom yeah, yeah, cornflakes. Dame los, dame los cornflakes. Yeah, right. But that's she, literally. She, she's pointing at like yeah. you know Cheerios, or she's pointing at uh, Fruity Loops, or whatever. Yeah. But but that's you know like that's it sounds like that's what culture night market's gonna be. Yeah. Is like you know people are oh this is a culture night market. Yeah. Like, it, it's the, definitely it was definitely uh like intentional with the branding because originally I was gonna do like San Jose. It was going to be like a San Jose thing, and then we were like uh, Mer cultura de, uh, Mercado de Cultura. Like we were going to do like a Spanish branding, but then I was like, nah, like we got to make this appeal to all demographics. And on top of that, we got to lead with culture. Like I stood so strong on that, bro. You don't understand. Like San Jose did not embrace hip hop. San Jose did not like, you know, the lifestyle that the culture already had here. They didn't embrace that shit. Well, bro, it's not that they didn't embrace it. It's that the no. people who were previously representing it were fucking... Dude, they're, they're not doing shit. Bro, like, I, I don't go out on um, fucking Cinco de Mayo anymore, bro. Yeah. I almost got fucking murdered on Cinco de Mayo. Oh, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't go, bro. Like, there, there's, you know, there's there's not very many people who are doing it in a way. Like, no one's going to go to a culture night market and act stupid. Yeah. No one's going to go to a culture night market and, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you can go to a culture night market and feel safe. Yeah. You can go to, you know, everybody's going to, like... <sighs> But but that's the culture that you created, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of these other events too that they just weren't done in the way that you're doing it now. So that's yeah. you know so there's that stigma that got created yeah. by past organizers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it was just big on like just setting a standard, like because if we take this approach and we do things the right way, that's gonna motivate people to follow that blueprint. And I hope people recreate this event in a different way because we need to have more representation of black and brown people, minorities, people that love hip hop, that love art. Like we need more of that shit. Like, you know what really inspired me? 
two events in particular. Trap Art, which is was started in Oakland. They have hip hop music, they got art, they got girls, you know, getting painted on. Like it's just so dope. You know what I mean? Like, and then first Fridays in Oakland, that was another event that I was doing pop-ups at. And they had like they had people turf dancing, mm -hmm. you know, they had three different stages. You got one hip hop here, you got one set of jazz there. And that's the shit that San Jose was missing. I'm like, they need to lean on the culture because the culture is the most influential thing in the whole world. You got people that live in Liberia and Brazil and Nicaragua that don't know nothing about Elon Musk. But if you ask them about Snoop Dogg and Tupac, they're gonna be like, oh, they're gonna start rapping some shit. Yeah, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? And that's yeah. the point is that people always underestimate the culture. And that's where I'm like, nah, man, we've been underdogs forever. It's, it's yeah. time to take lead. Yeah, well, it's it's getting to the point. Like I just saw, uh, I just saw at your Southside event. I think it's Oak Grove. Uh, no, Seven Trees. Seven Trees. Yeah. yeah, Seven Trees. I saw I saw a lady on the news. It's funny. Like they oh, put yeah. th I know they, they put say. like two or three different people, and they all said, "Oh yeah, it's you know, it's just um, it's the culture. Like it's yep. it's start it's starting to turn into like yep. uh, you know, you're ingraining that into people's yep. minds now mm -hmm. as well. So I'm 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 happy to say that you. Uh, you know, you're you're really uh, at the forefront of a lot of this, right? I think I think that you're one of the first people. See, this is okay. This is where artists need business-minded entrepreneurs, yeah. and then business-minded entrepreneurs also need yeah, artists, right? For sure. Because, like, you know, before, because what what the entrepreneur brings is the organization. Yeah. The, you know, you have a mindset of. Okay, I'm going to build a website. I'm going to build a system behind the social media. We're going to have account. We're going to have structure. We're going to have, yeah. you know, like there's there's processes for everything for sure. inside, right? And and typically when you know when you're working with, um, when you're working with artists, for the most part, and then this this goes to like ninety percent, you know, they're not good at that, yeah, right? They, they lack, want to create. Yeah, they lack business etiquette. Right. Yeah. Uh, Etiquette, um, it's I I, th I don't know if it's etiquette. I think it's it, it's just the only reason I say etiquette because you got rappers out DM, but hey, what's up? Put me on, bro. And I'm like, first and foremost, you gotta have a formal approach if you want to work with someone, right. especially if they're doing something that you want to be a part of. Correct. That's what I mean by business etiquette. But yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a part of it, I guess. Yeah, and there's yeah. so so you, you're bringing you're bringing all this mm -hmm. right, and um, you know so so let's let's actually go sh go more into the event. Okay. Yeah. So this is where I'm gonna ask you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh oh, there you go. All right. Drop. So, break it down for us, bro. Mm. How does break out break down the logistics of an event? How does it work? Like, you know, get get give us as much as you can here, right? Yeah. And and also, cause are you still working on this full time? Yeah, right now it's full time. This and Emlyn. Um, so what, what brings you more money, Culture Night or Emlyn? Uh, I think for sure Culture Night Market um, because it's event, it's an well, event based. What thing. I'm trying to point out is, ladies and gentlemen, he's a full time entrepreneur. Uh, <laughs> he, he built this up where you know he, he can live off of this now, right? And that's ultimately what you want to do as yeah. an entrepreneur. And I don't right? want I don't want to mislead the audience thinking like oh, I'm chilling, posted like Nah, I literally work more hours doing this than I did at my previous job. And, it, and it's not always like rainbows and shit. There's, there's been situations where like my livelihood is at risk because I'm trying to maintain this movement. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I almost got evicted. Like I couldn't afford the rent. I had to like put in letters to try to get some support financially. Like I had to literally uh, eat shit a little bit even after I had my high ups. A lot of it. A lot of I, it. I, I, bro, Plate full I, I, of shit. I was, bro, I Served was, I, with a fork and knife and everything. I, I was there the night when you fucking crashed the U. <laughs> oh yeah, bro. That was wild. That was like one of our... Our good, good, good milestones too. Yeah. We activated Eastridge. Um, that was when we did a two-day event back to back at Eastridge, and um, you know, it, I, I appreciate you for being there. We'll break it down. Like, I literally uh, rented a U-Haul so we can store items, so they'll be easier for us to set up the day after. And then I was there till like one in the morning. So my, and I was there from 8 a.m. to like one in the morning. Obviously, back to back had a little break in between, but. I, after loading up the U-Haul and like sending our team home and everything, I, I try to park the U-Haul in the garage, not realizing that the fucking, the, the top part was lower than it should be. And keep in mind, it, it was negligent on Eastridge part too, because <laughs> they, they have the sign that says warning uh, 15 on feet, whatever, side. on the other side. But not on on this side. side, didn't say it though. So I yeah. fucking crashed the top of the U-Haul onto that shit. And I fucking slammed my face, bro. <laughs> 
I was like, what the fuck? He's like, I see a spark on that shit. Bro, I, I was, I was in front like, of the U-Haul truck and I just see a like, bro. I'm like, what the fuck? And I was driving so slow, bro. And I feel like God was talking to me in that moment because I was driving so slow. There was this couple walking right across the walkway and they were going so slow. In my mind, I'm like, bro, hurry the fuck up. But not realizing that was God telling me, bro, slow the fuck down. You're literally about to crash into this shit. Yeah. And not, but I'm just exhausted. I'm like, bro, I'm just trying to go home. You know what I mean? And the next thing you know, I fucking hit that. And all my heart drop, bro, everything. The only thing, I, the reason why this was such a big deal is because I could not afford extra bills and expenses. So instantly I thought, bro, that's 10K for this fucking truck. Like, oh my God, the world is over. And yeah. this is the day before the second event. So we still had another event the next day. Yeah. So uh, I, I get out the car, I look at it, I was like, dog, that shit is dead, bro. I'm like, that shit is, this shit is for show dead. And then, and then you were like, all right, bro, let's just go over here. Let's go take a look at it. So we go park. And then I'm like, bro, I'm just tripping out. And then that's why I appreciate you were there. You're like, all right, let's put it away. Let's lock it up. Let's go home, get some rest, and we'll come back and, we'll, and let's do the event tomorrow and yeah. we'll figure this shit out. So the next day, had the event, everything. I focused on the outcome of everything. After we got to the end of the event, then that's when we revisited uh, U-Haul. And then we walked in there. I talked to the manager. I was like, hey, man, I just want to let you know this is what happened. Blah, blah, blah. And I appreciate that manager too, bro, because you could tell he had experience doing this shit. Yeah, yeah. And he's like... Uh, he's like, all right, man, your total's going to be uh, 4,400, this, this, and that. That's with a 25% discount because I know you've been consistently coming to us, blah, blah. I'm like, so I appreciated his energy because he yeah. was like, he gave me a discount and yeah. he was kind of giving me an option on how to go about it. But I was thinking like 10 grand, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And he brought it down to 4,400. And I think I asked you for a front. I think I got a little bit, you, you helped me out a little bit and I paid for what I could. But the, the logic you gave me made so much sense because in that moment, I was, uh, Dave, uh, my uh, the homie Dave, he was trying to convince me to like take Keep. it to a repair shop, try to fix the truck, uh, extend the extend the lease uh, or the renting for the truck, so then we could try to rebuild it and then save a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. But the time and energy and the mental capacity of doing that would have made would have took so much away from me. Yeah. And, and the amount of skill set and and value I had to try to generate that money again, I have more of a chance of making that money back than trying to like save that car. And that's what you explained to me and it made yeah. sense. Yeah. But the, it was the, a wild the, moment. So the term is opportunity cost, but yeah. um, how can you guys relate to this in your own personal life? Like this, this shit happens to me all the time, right? There's sometimes they're like, I'll have something in my house. Like, okay, this table. I could sell this table at my house, yeah. like, you know, and I can get 20 bucks for it, 25 bucks, 50 bucks. <laughs> but let's say I can get 200 bucks. The fucking time that it's gonna take me to take the picture, put it online, respond to everybody, go yeah. back and forth, fucking coordinate them to come over here, take yeah. a look at it. Maybe they like it, maybe they don't like it. Like, like that in that same time that it took me to do all that shit. Yeah. Like, I, it's better for me to just give it away. Yeah. Right. Like, it's better. Like, and there's there's so many things that we're we're doing as opportunity costs in our lives, like uh, coupons. <laughs> Cool. You know, so there's people who fucking spend hours looking through coupons and shit. Like, yeah. you can spend those hours doing something else to yeah. make yourself money. Yeah, right? I see what you're saying. And, like, time. Time is important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, bro, like, uh, you know, fucking some some people, uh, you know, I, I got a Costco membership, but I'll tell you what, when that fucking line is not, like, immediately ready, I don't go to that motherfucker. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Because I'd rather pay an extra eight bucks to go fill up at Chevron, yeah. whatever, than wait fucking an hour mm -hmm. in a goddamn fucking Costco line. Yeah. Right? Costco, so, man, yeah, which I love Costco. I love Costco, but, but man, but bro. Fuck. My girl loves Costco, bro. I can't stand that shit. So, uh, so coming back, though, um, so that, that was like a, one of the, uh, you know, one of the obstacles, right? So coming back. So now let's let's go over uh, again, like lo logistics for this event. Right. Yeah. Um, and why, why, why don't you just like run us through a day of an event? Like what, so people actually understand what goes to it because this, yeah. this guy, like from the time, so that at, when I went to go help out at Eastridge, I didn't live in San Jose at the time because yeah. of COVID. Yeah. And I actually you stayed the night in my yeah, spot. He, yeah. he, I spent the night in his office. No, <laughs> or, yeah, in my the, office, in my apartment. Yeah. In his yeah. apartment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, um, but the point is though that, uh, like I was with you from the beginning to the end, right? So yeah. let's run through a day. Yeah. Of M1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or not, sorry, of Culture, Culture Night, Night Market. Yeah. Sorry. So I'll go based on the one we just did. So we did the Dog Olympics at Oak Ridge Mall. Shout out to Westfield. Dog basically. Olympics? Yeah, we did a Culture Night Market Dog Olympics. What? Yeah, it was epic. Y'all should have <laughs> y'all went. I got videos, though. We'll send y'all the recap. But basically, I got there on site at 8 a.m. Um, well, actually, before I go into it, I got to go before. So Monday, we have our admin meeting where we talk about administrative side, permits, 
um, what has to be submitted, what permits we got to give to our food vendors, um, what operation details we got to go over. And then on Thursday, we have our operations meeting, which is specifically about our staff count, who's going to do the morning shift, who's going to do the afternoon shift, who's going to do the evening shift. And then we kind of break down as far as um, what are the checklists. We do a, we have a printed checklist where we talk about um, what needs to get loaded in, the generator, the light, the light tower, the barricades, um, and then our personal equipment, who's gonna come to the office, pick up our equipment, take it to storage at Oak Ridge. We have to call Oak Ridge Security, get them to open the storage, load it all up. So that's all before the event. So there's a lot of preparation before the event uh, uh, via Zoom and Google Meets and all that. And then on Saturday, that's when we actually, I, and honestly, I'm just the type where I just, I can't wait, I gotta just go. So I go early, uh, yeah, I go early, go. and uh, I go set up at eight in the morning, and I go meet uh, some of my staff there to start basically setting up the canopy, the basic stuff, the garbage, and also the bathrooms, and then the lights is the most tedious thing, which is the string <laughs> lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Did the it. most tedious <laughs> thing. And yeah, I set them up every time. So I had it all set up, so when my team actually got there yeah. at like 9.30, 10 a.m., they started the heavy barricades and also the lights. So I try to make that as a soft landing as possible. Obviously, long term, I would love, I would love to have someone else do all that for me, but I'm just not at that pl uh, place yet where I can I can hand it off completely. So I go early to make sure some of the little things are, are taken care of. And then once the full setup is done, barricades, lights, and everything, um, E and Blanco, for example, our vendor liaisons, they'll be the ones checking in the vendors. Be like, and they do all the numbers. They chalk it number one through 40, and all the spots are designated. Mm -hmm. So before, we used to be like, first come, first serve, go sit yeah. up where you want. Now we do designated spots so people can like just show up and unload and then park. Is, is that like the designated spots? Are you guys going over those like on the Monday meeting, like who gets yeah. what spot? So uh, Blanco takes full lead on who goes where. And he, he now has a good relationship with the vendors where he can be like, all right, we're going to put arts and crafts here. We're going to put you know, mm. clothes here. We're going to put candles there. So it becomes like a, an experience for the customer. When they come, they can actually go and, and get options of the same thing yeah. as opposed to going candle vendor here and their favorite candle vendors all the way across the event. And like right. that, that becomes missed opportunity sometimes. Well, yeah, it, it does because, you know, like I feel like this is a good time yeah. um, to explain the psychology behind that too. Yeah. Um, so when you have, um, so there was a, there was a study that they did, uh, with a Coke machine and a Pepsi machine. Mm. So what they actually put a, uh, a Coke machine, um, so they put, they put a Coke machine in a location and, um, they saw how, how many, uh, you know, they, they recorded like how much sales it did. Mm. They put the Pepsi machine in the same place. Yeah. Saw how many sales it did. Um, and then they, uh, you know, and then they basically put the Coke machine and the Pepsi machine next to each other, mm -hmm. right? And then they studied how many sales machines or how many sales e each machine did. Um, so my question to you is like, when do you think, uh, in what scenario do you think sold most? Like what made the who, 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 who do you, Okay, like I guess like when, when, the, uh, when the Coke machine and the Pepsi machine were there, who do you think else sold who? Oh, probably Coke. Okay, like individually? Just because of brand. So you think Coke sold more um, when it was individual versus Pepsi? Um, yeah. Okay. I'll just say that just because of Coke. Fuck so, okay, let's just say that Coke did sell more, yeah. right? Now, um, oh, I'll just get to the fucking point because I'm confusing my goddamn self. The point, the point is of, of this study is that when they put both of the machines together, yeah. they both sold more yeah. than when they were individual. Yeah. Because it, it comes to a point not of, like the question that a consumer asks when they see a Coke machine or individual Pepsi machine is, do I want a Coke yeah. or do I want a Pepsi? Or, yeah. or am I even, or sorry, yeah. do I even, am I even thirsty? That's yeah. like the question, am I thirsty? Yeah. And the answer might be yes or no, right? And when you put two machines next to each other, it's not, am I thirsty? It's which one do I want? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like in sales, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you put two options in front of a customer and you yeah. say, you know, which, which, which one do you like better, the Android one or do you yeah. like the iPhone whatever? Yeah. The question wasn't, do you want to buy a phone? Yeah. The question is, which one do you want better? Yeah. And that's what happens when you put those machines next to each other. Yeah. So psychologically speaking, um, you know, to maybe to the vendors who don't understand, they might be like, why did you put me right next to my competition? Yeah. But it it actually puts them in an advantage because yeah. now the person's not thinking, do I want a candle? Yeah. Now the person's thinking, which candle do I want? Exactly. Yeah, no, you, you, had, you hit it spot on. It was really just like accessibility like because events big sometimes so we might not get you might not even get the opportunity 
to get that customer because that customer might walk a specific direction that doesn't cross your path. But now, like to your point, now that you're all next to each other, now you're an option as opposed to not even getting an opportunity. Yeah. And I think the second thing is just experience too. Like for the consumer, they wanna, they wanna, they wanna be wowed by all the different types of people that are there. Maybe you have a candle that's all designed on scent. They have amazing scents. Maybe another one looks like uh, uh, is shaped as a, a, a woman's body. Like there's vendors <laughs> that sell women's body candle. Yeah. Or there's another one that's like a candle with themes. You know what I'm saying? It's like people wanna. Sometimes they might end up buying all of them because yeah. they're all different. Um, but I think that was really Blanco's call. So he was the one that did more of the homework as far as like why we put them in, in specific areas. But it did make more sense Got it. Um, because in the past it was just some people weren't benefiting from being far out. In their mind, they thought they were because they're separate from their competition. But in actuality, it's like you're getting more chances of getting sales by being around where the people are browsing through. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just like in general, like if you go to a, a place that's busy, your chances are you're gonna get more sales versus you being the only person in one place, like that taco truck that's like in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, versus a foodie event, yeah. you're gonna get hundreds of people. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So yeah. I don't know, it was it was just that, you know what I mean? Okay. We didn't dive too deep into it, but it was just a decision. So you guys are very meticulous with like these details, right? So now, okay, you're, you're setting everything up, you know, vendors get there, but we're, we're gonna let this one, we're gonna let this one run because yeah. there's, yeah, usually I, I'm getting the sign for 50 minutes. Usually we stop at an hour, but yeah. I, I have a lot of stuff I need to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So now vendors, you, you know where the vendors are going to go. Okay. Uh, keep going. Um, so, yeah, we basically put the vendor layout. We send that out in advance so vendors can kind of prepare themselves on where to set up and all that stuff. Um, and then... From there, once the vendors are loading in from 12 to 3, that takes a lot of time. You know, cars are pulling in, they're setting up, they're unloading, we're having the park in the area. And then once they're all set up between 3 to 4, that's when the, I'm sorry, from 2.30 to 3.30, that's when the food trucks get there. Mm. So the food trucks are like the biggest things. They're like huge, 7 feet tall. They got to be 2 feet apart from each food booth. That's like a, in compliance for fire code. So they have to be at least 2 feet apart from each food truck. And we have to measure that before they get there. Mm -hmm. So when they get there... Uh, they pull up, they park, and then from three to four, we have the fire inspection and the Department of Health inspection, and that's wow. like an hour before the event. So we have to make sure that they're all set up, and they have to be set up enough time for the inspector to do the inspection. No fucking way. Yeah. And then, so they have it. So the inspectors are actually going into the food trucks. And yeah, shit. they're going to the food trucks. They're seeing their fire extinguishers are up to date. They're seeing that the distance are accurate. They have the sink, the hand wash stations. They have to. They have to check all that. See, and it's funny because people probably look at Culture Night Market like, I could do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time, bro. All the time. People always want to throw suggestions on how to do it. But I'm like, you know, I'm always open to feedback and constructive criticism. But when people try to tell me how to run my business, that's when I get kind of annoyed. But yeah. it's all part of it. But, but I, I didn't even know that this shit happens, right? So, yeah. okay, keep going. So now they're inspecting all the Yeah, so they trucks. do the inspections. And then Angie, our project manager, or Blanco, our other project manager, will sign off on it to get the approval. They'll give us feedback if something's not up to date. So, for example, we had a bar set up, which was a truck, and uh, originally they told us that we were good, that we didn't need a sink, but now they told us we needed a sink because I think they were they were rimming drinks. Whenever there's, like, um, any preparation involved, there has to be a sink and a hand wash station. So it's, like, stuff like that. If you get, um, if you get like, a, a flag on something, they can sit, they can close you down. They can make you, like, shut down. And I don't want the bar to shut down. That's, like, an element to the event. Yeah. So I'm like... I was like, so what do we got to do? Like, do we have to buy a gallon of water and a little sink? Like, I, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, There's yeah. situations where I'll literally go to Target and go save their shit yeah. just to make sure it happens. And that's another thing people don't understand either. Well, let's talk about the alcohol, right? Because, like, I, I actually haven't been to an event where you have alcohol, yeah. right? And um, so so that goes to show you, like, I remember when you were talking about the idea. Yeah. Right? And then I remember I talked to you one time and you were all excited, like, bro, we had alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's only happened a few times. So how, yeah. how, does, how does that even work? It's this very long process. So you have to actually get a permit from San Jose Police Department. You have to file an ABC permit and you have to get it approved from the from the chief of the police department and they have to sign off on it. And before they do that, they have to see your your um, your your setup and who you're working with. You have to get an approved handler's license and you have to be RBS certified, meaning like you have to be certified to to sell the alcohol. And the alcohol permit has to be filed from a nonprofit. You can't file it as a business. It has to be done by a nonprofit. Mm 
Wow. And um, so Local Color, shout out to them, they're our fiscal sponsor. So they help us a lot with our certifications and our, our permits, and they also help us out with our insurances. So they're a big help of Culture Night Market. W would they ever help just any other market? Or is it something? I think it, our, our situation was very unique. Is like I'm an actual member of Local Color, like my office is in their facility. So after seeing our movement and everything, they, they actually offered to be a resource for us. So that's why they're a very big partner of ours wow yeah and uh yeah that's another thing a lot of people would fucking go crazy trying to figure out that was actually brought to us really early so thanks to them we were able to get this far for well sure. that, that's i would say that even falls in the category of you know it's a relationship but it's also business development but yeah that, that didn't mm -hmm. happen overnight no for right? sure i yeah. had to sell them like why we're worth working yeah you know and, and i know that like one of uh one of the founders or something uh or top members like they, they mentor you right yeah aaron uh i mean carmen carmen's been the one that's been really supportive from the very beginning and uh, she, she started off as a program director just for one of the spaces, and now she handles all the fiscal sponsors. And, and they do a lot of work for the community. Like, they help people get paid. They help artists get paid. And they've helped us receive a couple grants. So they're, they're huge. Yeah. Here. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So coming back to the alcohol license, now you have to get the handlers. Yes, yeah, so all the paperwork. Basically, once all that's submitted, then you got to pay the fees. The fees can range from, like, 600 bucks to 700 bucks. That's just the permit. In order for you to sell alcohol, you have to have security. You have to have a barricaded event or a beer garden. So that means that the, the, the bar has to be barricaded in or the whole venue has to be barricaded. If you don't have any or of those, you cannot do the alcohol permit. So, that, so basically, our costs go from 600 to 2000 because now you got to pay for the permit, the security, and then the permit itself. I think I said permit twice. Permit, security, and barricades, yeah. Dude, okay. So that's why we don't always do a bar because how, it has to make financial sense. How much does one of these fucking events cost you roughly between oh, labor? Shit, now you want me to give the game game? Uh, just, I, just give us like a okay. How, how about this? Uh, six grand, up or down? Up. Over six grand, guys. Yeah. To run an event, let's just let's just let's yeah. leave it there. Wait, yeah. over ten? Uh, it depends. It can be. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. All right. So, guys, like Culture Night Market, you, you got you guys have to realize like this is like the fucking real deal. Yeah, okay? it's, it's serious. Yeah. Um, all keep right. in mind, we don't always profit. Like, I have to be clear too. Like, sometimes we literally go red just to make the event happen because yeah. it's not always a success. You know, we get yeah. locations that are new. We activate different places. Like, we're really big on activating locations that never get love. You know what I'm saying? Seven Trees Community Center being one of them, Coronado Avenue on the south side, Oak Ridge Mall. I mean, I was one of the first organizers to be like, let's go to the south side. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, yeah. everyone's always doing events downtown. When was the last time you heard about a big event happening on the south side? We are one of the only wow. people that have done that. Yeah. And they appreciate that. District 2, District 10, all the community members in those neighborhoods, they, they, they appreciate it because the thing is, um, a lot of us don't have the luxury of having transportation to downtown and to go on this side of town. We got big families we got to take care of. And sometimes they want to go something that's walking distance. You know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm. So we weigh those things into account. And that's why we activate all over San Jose and not just downtown. You yeah. know what I mean? So East Side being another one. Um, because it's, uh, it's a real thing, man. There's, there's a big... Big communities out here that don't have the privilege to do certain shit that other communities have. Yeah, see, and that's and that's something special about you because you know what you like. It's easy to run a market that's in the same exact place every single weekend. Yeah, right. You can have your shit stored there. It's like set up every single time. Everything's perfect. Yeah. It's like, what do you do when you showed up at Eastridge Hella early and there's still fucking four cars in your guys' spot? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's happened before too. Yeah. Like, Bro. But one thing I will add though is. Um, uh, this is where laws and policies affect businesses because we were forced to become a hybrid model business. I never even called it a hybrid model business. The city of San Jose labels, labeled us that um, because they have this zoning policy where when you activate a private parking lot, uh, let's just say the grad, the one right behind the grad, for example, you can only activate a private parking lot five times within a span of uh, four to six months. No then, way. So then if you wanted to do it again the sixth time there, you have to wait four more months to activate it again. And that doesn't go just for you. Let's just say uh, Lola wants to activate that spot now a month you're after. Sh sharing the fucking... Now we're sharing those dates. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that affects businesses. And that affected us so much during the pandemic, bro. That's why I felt I had a very like bittersweet relationship with the city because I felt like they were verbally telling us they want to help us out. But then these policies and these laws were killing us, bro. Like, that's how I'm going to say, like, 
they were killing it. I felt like what we were doing, we were providing a solution to the community, but when they threw those roadblocks at us, it just felt personal. Like I took it personal, I'll be real. I was just like, like we're trying to help people and you guys are making it harder, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But what I've learned is that those policies were made before the pandemic mm -hmm. and they're outdated, like they need to be changed. And yeah. we've already voiced this to people in the council and people in the city and stuff like that to try to change that. Um, and I think there are doing some stuff. There are making permit. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna become a politician? Nah, bro. <laughs> I cannot do politics, bro. I just, like I said, I feel like the event stuff has made me conscious of the political landscape, but I'm just, I don't fuck with that shit. Yeah. Like I always grew up listening to Tupac and shit like that. And, and just like seeing how the poor and the rich are always disconnected. Like yeah. that's, that's just something that's in me. But you know, I think I'm, I'm more educated and I'm, I'm more aware, but, um, that that policy though is what forced us to move from downtown to Coronado to Eastridge because I, once I found out that we can only do five events, I have vendors that are like, "When's the next event? Like, I really need the money. Like, I need the events. I need to have a next location to set up at." So I was like, I felt like I, I don't, I'm going to say the word obligated. I'm just saying like I felt like I need to make this shit happen. Yeah. Like it's got to happen. Yeah. So I kept calling different places, and once we found a new location, I got four, five more dates. Called another I, I location, had, five bro, more dates. I had no idea that was a reason. And I don't know if it's, I'm going to say the reason, maybe. You it did. is definitely the reason. It's the, okay. So I had But it was no a idea. blessing in disguise, though. Right, yeah, because, like, now, okay, so I had no idea that that was the reason why Emlyn is in multiple locations. I yeah. had no idea. Mm. That's so fucking enlightening, guys. Like, mm. have you ever told that to anybody? I've told a few people, but I feel like people don't realize the magnitude of it. Yeah. Like, because, you know, some people come to Culture Night Market once in a while. Sometimes people come every event, but, like, people don't see a lot of the stuff that happens behind the scenes. He, he doesn't He doesn't move the location to, or the event to different locations for his health, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> no, especially not my health. But, but the beautiful <laughs> thing is, though, is, like, now... Bro, you, you you now have the experience to activate anywhere. Yeah, for sure. That's why now Culture Night Market is more than just a, a marketplace. We are an event production company. So if somebody has a vision of activating places, we can help make that into a reality. That's why we're going to do concerts this year. We've already helped out San Jose Jazz with their previous activation last year. Really? Um, we helped out with the blow. Wait, hold on. San Jose Jazz is big. Yeah, San Jose Jazz is big. So we helped uh, activate the Tropicana stage right here that happened on Sofa. So they had one big stage and we helped organize 40 vendors and we activated another stage and we put some like light installations. But that was all from our, our we, we played our part is what I'm saying. Like yeah. San Jose Jazz is a very big and yeah. re well-respected company out here. Um, but we helped activate that portion of the event. Wow. So they do 30 stages, so, you know, they're huge. 30 stages? I think it was like, tw I don't know, I might be overdoing it. I think it was like 20 stages or something like that. Wow. But they do them, like, in hotels. They do them on streets. Those are Chavez. So I have a lot of respect for Brendan, uh, Brandon Rossin, the executive director over there. He's really cool people and stuff like that. They always, they actually, the, he sat down with me and gave me an opportunity, and I, and I respect that. And he looked past who I was and how I presented myself, and he respected what we did and we have a relationship now, so. Got y'all hip-hop folks, you know. Got, got, got them hip-hop folks out there. Hey, but they brought out Common, though, you know what I'm saying? So they, oh, they, they know what's up. Common out here? Yeah, they uh, brought Common. Man, see, I'm so out of the loop, I think they're, I think I heard the worth of the grapevine is they're going to bring De La Soul out here. Oh, really? Yeah, he's hard, too. De and I think, uh, I forgot who the other person was, but yeah. All right. So um, now you're setting up, okay, coming back. So you guys, you guys are, I hope you guys are understanding. See, like, if, if people have made it this far into the podcast, like these are the people that deserve to know. These are people that are fucking. Oh curious, yeah, for right? sure they tuned in. Yeah. So now they okay. So when it comes to so now we understand the complex, the complexities of alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. So then food. I just want to like bring up like a, a specific uh, time, right? And, and I don't want to bring this up because uh, like I'm like oh I thought of this or nothing like that. This is not even why. Mm -hmm. I just remember like you know because as as I one of the cool things that I get really hyped about is looking into other people's businesses mm -hmm. and then figuring out how to make things yeah. uh, either more efficient opportunities because like it's funny because like you could probably come into my business mm -hmm. and show me things that I'm missing. Yeah. But because it's always easier to look at somebody else's problem or look at somebody else's shit mm. and critique their shit. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's always fucking easier. But, um, you know, we talk, I remember, like, you know, you uh, you said, hey, very excited, you were like, bro, the barbecue people sold out, and these people sold yeah. out, and mm. these people sold out. Yeah. And I listened to that, and I was like... Yeah. 
I already know where you're going with this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, go, go with so, it. So it's a double-edged sword, yeah. I'm going to be real, um, because it is very expensive to activate the food component of the businesses because those permits are not cheap. The county, they charge everything from filing a permit late to uh, having someone to go out there to do an inspection. So sometimes our, our permit fees can range from 500 as high as 1100 and it's frustrating because sometimes and that's separate from the alcohol. That's separate from the alcohol, and maybe we'll have one uh, like TFF permit for the booth, which is like a hundred bucks. But for the food vendors, like I think um, it's huge opportunity for them. You know what I mean? Especially when we have a sellout event and it's busy, like they can make really good money, and they have in the past. But like I think I've learned a lot in the last six months about food because we've went through a lot of turbulence. Like our events weren't that great; they weren't that busy. Um, we were activating new locations. I think what I learned on a side note is that expansion isn't always good. Mm. Like, I think we expanded a little too fast and we might have bit more than what we could chew as far as like trying to activate more places than we've already done mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the ones that have been really good and just polishing them up and building a better experience. So then it's overall successful. Um, so with with the model we did in the past, it was just like a flat fee. And we were just like, hey, pay this and let's run it up. And that was it. Um, and, I, and I was okay doing that because we were just starting out. It was for yeah. the first two years. But as we evolved, I realized, like, we need to make this make sense because we were losing money. Yeah, well, to, if you're paying fucking $1,100 for the permits and then there's six trucks that each pay you 200 bucks, yeah, like $1,200. Yeah, like, okay. Yeah, and that's only if we have six trucks. So it's yeah. like, sometimes we weren't even breaking even. Um, so obviously implementing a different model where, you know, the vendor can pay a fee or they can pay a profit split fee. Um, that helped out a lot because that determined... You know, if the event's successful, then guess what? We, we both win off of it. But if it's not successful, that's where it's kind of like a double-edged sword because some of them aren't so happy with that turnout. And I've learned that because um, I think our rates are like 400 for a flat fee and then 200 plus a profit split. So I think that's fair because if the event is bringing 2,000 people and you only pay 200 bucks and then you pay, you know, 15% of your 5K, for example, that's great for us. Right. But if it's an event where it's like there's only 300 people in attendance and you pay that 200 and then you pay that extra profit split, sometimes that might equate to half of what they make. And that's where it gets kind of like I you, realize you know, that there's a flaw in the system. You know, I just thought about something. You know, yeah. you know what the next level is? The next step is What's up? teaching these vendors how to build their databases for sure. And, and that's something that we also discussed internally is that some of the businesses don't operate to the full magnitude as, as they should. You know, they're not promoting in advance. They're not advertising. They're not stepping out, giving samples. They're not doing certain things to really maximize the opportunity. And they're really dependent on us, which... Hey, let's, see, let's teach them. Yeah, I want to, but I already got so much on my plate. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes we've had this... We've, so what we did in the beginning of the year, what we did different this year, is that we offered an exclusive rate for vendors that wanted to pay for the whole year. So we said, hey, look... If you want to partake in all these 14 events this year, I'm going to give you a discounted rate, but you have to pay in full up front. And we did that with two of our vendors and it worked out great. Like some of them have already made their money back. Mm -hmm. Like the food trucks, like the, they did San Jose Day and bro, there was 8,000 people there. Like wow. they fucking killed it. I already know they made their money back. Yeah. But for the ones that are boosts, they weren't able to participate in certain events. So they have yet to make their money back. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm learning about this whole process about because the incentives are good. Now I'm focused on experience. Like I'm really focused on building the experience where the people not only come, but they stay. That's really the biggest thing. And I think with the Dog Olympics this past Saturday, we actually executed on that because we had programming from the beginning all the way until nine. And we had, um, we had benches and we had all these activities. We had music. And I think a lot of people literally stayed and they went and came back. And that, that's something that we really focused on this last event, and it, and it showed, you know what I'm saying? So I think um, to the whole business model of the food stuff, it's, it's still a development. And I feel like there is a lot of opportunity to make m money off the food stuff, but it's really important that we respect their processes because it's one thing for a business that sells clothes where let's just say they come out, they, they only sell half of their quota, right? They can still pack that food. Pack, uh, they can still pack those clothes and bring it back to the next event. Yeah. Food businesses, they'll spend all that money and they'll lose that money because that food goes bad. Right. And that's something that I've learned that it's very important to respect what they're investing to and making sure that they're going to succeed in our events. Now, you know what you should do? 
this up. <laughs> me All right. Uh, what I would do if I were you, right? So there's so there's a lot of there's a lot of times where, for example, like let's say somebody starts a lead generation business, right? Yeah. And they just they get really fucking good at generating leads for window tinting. Yeah. Like they become so good where they know that they can go into any market in the U.S. and overnight they can blow up a window tinting business. Yeah. You know because they got the formula for SEO. They know how to run the ads yeah. on Facebook and Google. Like they know they got it right. Yeah. <clears throat> so it, it turns to a point where like you're so good at doing that it's like well you might as well fucking own a window tinting business at that point yeah because it's like then instead of making ten dollars per lead like now you can make a hundred dollars for every time or however much they make you know for yeah. every time you tint a window obviously there's the whole business side and whatnot yeah but like um and you've probably already thought about this, but like, are you gonna, you know, when when is when is BQ's taco truck coming up? You know, it's funny you say that, bro, because that yeah. definitely has been a discussion. Like, we want to sell like it's like when you go to the baseball games and the, and the Pop Warner games. They have their nachos, they have their hot dogs, and Correct. that's like their source of income, Correct. To fundraise and stuff, right? And we've thought about that, and, and we were thinking like, all right, let's think of like low risk, like very easy to afford, like to spend, and it's not gonna be like permit 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 like it's like very easy to do so we were thinking like mexican candies and like um nachos and stuff like that but i think the reality is that the weight of all of the other stuff this past six months specifically mm -hmm. have really slowed down those those ideas but yeah, but, but that's to where, take it back to what you said though yeah. my goal in my lifetime is to open a nicaragüense business mm -hmm. a food nicaragüense food business there so i go. definitely would explore that into this yeah, because like, then that would be a very special touch. You know, like, I mean? like, here, here's the a thing, right? Touch. Like, and, okay, so let's just say, for example, you, um, okay, I got family here. Yep. Uh, your mom, your fucking, your mom. Yeah, your, your mom cooks. <laughs> yeah, why don't you just tell you, you know, go, go get, go borrow somebody's food license. Yeah, test it out. Yeah, and just make it very simple. Gallo pinto. Yeah, like maybe a piece of asada. Yeah, a piece of pollo. Yep. Platano. Yeah. Ensalada. Yeah. And tell her to prepare like 50 plates. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like 50, the amount of like, okay, yeah. I'm, and just sell that one thing and see what happens. Yeah. No, I think I think that might be worth a try. I think for the Nicaragüense food, there's still some uh, resources to be uh, identified, like the ingredients specifically. But I do got to plug that imports, just so you know. What are you, what you talking about? Like, which one are you talking about? Like getting, like, queso frito and shit like that. Man, okay, you don't know. I'm just saying, to make it, to but make I, it nice. I, Okay, I'm but talking about... we're talking about just food, though, yes, I do think that that's doable. Like, that, but that's that's the thing, right? Because, like, you, you think about it, right? If you, you know, because at these events, you could charge a little extra, too, for the plate, right? Mm. So, like, let's just say you had a plate like that. What what do other vendors charge like for, like, okay, like the plate of barbecue, right? Yeah, I think it was, like, 16, 16 bucks. Okay. So, you know, you do, you do 16 times, let's just say you sold 100 that's an extra $1,600 in that event. Yeah. And the food cost is probably going to be like 25%, 30%, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like 800 bucks. Yeah. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, and your mom helped out for a day. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, so. Really, I don't know how much you would charge. I don't, no, I guess that's a question for you. Let's just pretend that that's what happened. How do you compensate the employees running the, the food spot? Do you do it per hour? Do you give them a cut of what you make? Like, how do you how do you approach it? Well, it's it's a partnership, right? Okay. So you know, if your mom's gonna come in and, and how like if it if it's my mom, bro, like my mom's a hard negotiator. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she she's taking fifty percent. Like she so don't give. That, yeah, let's pretend it's not our mom, but it's someone that is a hard negotiator. Is it still the same terms? Well, bro, if they do everything and all you had to do was give them a space at your event. That's that's an extra fucking couple hundred bucks. Yeah. For you, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, obviously, like, uh, and let's just say, let's just say it's not Nicaraguan food. Let's say it's an easier food. Yeah, like just tacos. Tacos, fucking perfect, perfect tacos. Um, you know, so in in a case like that, it really depends. Like, if they can bring the grill, <coughs> if they can prepare all the ingredients, make the salsas, prep the meat, they do all of that. <coughs> yeah, I'll split fifty fifty. Yeah. So the thing with the food, just to be aware, is if you don't have a food truck, it's complicated because if you have, if you let's just say you cook out of the house, you have to have a commissary kitchen, meaning that you have to either rent a commissary kitchen, which is hella expensive, because that means that you're renting out of a public facility that's like inspected and everything, and now that doubles your cost. But if you have a cottage permit, which is like an annual thing, then you can actually prep out of your house. But this is where like it gets complicated with food businesses because there's so many like restrictions. And it, and it affects the way you make money. Um, but if you have a food truck, I think that's the biggest hack because it's a big investment up front. 
But now you have the kitchen. It's a portable commissary kitchen, essentially. And you could just cook wherever you want. And the permit's valid for the whole year. Okay, so c coming back to the question, I think I'm willing to bet that there is somebody out there in San Jose yeah. who bought a food truck, figured out it's not as easy as it fucking yeah. looks like it, right? They think it's a culture night market. I could just put this shit together, yeah. right? They think it's a, just a food truck. I'm just going to do this together. Like, yeah. you know, they, maybe they went through the permitting process. They got all that stuff done, and yeah. they're like, damn, like, I can't even park my truck anywhere. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> you know, bro. right. So there's, I guarantee you, in this city, there are going to be at least a handful of people that are in that situation mm. where it's just, hey, yeah. You've been hurting. I have these. How many times? How many events are you having now a month? This month? I mean, this year? A month. Oh, a month. Uh, we're gonna start doing two. So, two? Okay. Yeah. Hey, I, I got two events a month. Mm -hmm. Bring your truck, and uh, we'll split. You know, we'll split fifty-fifty, mm -hmm. right? Or what? Or whatever. Like basically, whatever is a better deal than what you're doing right now. Yeah. It it could, it could even be. You know, it could even, because bro, like the the number one the number one thing in business is bringing in sales. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, and also you can get it to like, hey, well, I will, I will kick out other trucks to put mm -hmm. your truck here. Yeah. Because now people want to come to this event. Yeah. But anyway. Um, like you got trucks like tuned in. They're like, hey, you better not kick me out, bro. <laughs> like, well, I mean, but, I th but, no, but no, but it's, it just, no, it gets to the point where those, those trucks, like, bro, like they're going to have to, you know, um, you, you get better deals when you have other offers. Like, it's just yeah. like, it, it's just fucking business, bro. Yeah. No, for it's, sure. It's business. So. Somebody bought this, uh, you know, somebody was going to buy this for five bucks. And I said, wait, 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 I'll give you 30. Hold it for me. Yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to give it to the guy who's going to give me 30. Right. Yeah. Like anyway. So, okay. Coming back to coming back to the event. Right. So now uh, alcohol, food. Um, now, now you got to fucking do the event. Yep. The event itself, um, four to ten. So it's six hours. Um, I have staff that do all the preparation before and close down after. During the event, the only revenue that's being accounted for is just the profit split of the food, um, the bar sales, and uh, that's really it. And then obviously if we sell merch or product of our own, which we do, um, we have our own information booth. So what I really focus on during the events is data. Like I focus on getting emails, I focus on getting phone numbers and stuff like that through the raffles. So we do these raffles where the MC is like, hey, we got a free raffle at the booth. We're giving out free prizes. If you want to go participate, go to the front uh, booth, scan the QR code, fill out the survey, and you get a free raffle ticket, yeah. no charge. And um, how we do it is that we ask all the vendors to donate a, a prize, something that they're willing to give out, sticker, mm -hmm. a hat, um, you know, a candle, whatever. So we do that every event, and we usually get like 20 prizes. Like people are really gracious to donate. And it's good for them because we make the people follow their Instagram. They're like, hey, make sure you follow their Instagram because you got the free prize. Um, but like just from that, we'll get like almost a hundred leads just for the day and yeah. that'll add on to our newsletter and mm -hmm. our outreach and stuff like that. So that's really my focus is data capturing and then capturing the amount of people coming in. But I do think there's area of opportunity to grow with like making money during the event too. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's always going to be, cause it, it can come back to the other ideas. Like, what do you think will sell? Like, okay, food's too complicated. Alcohol's too complicated. You know, you know these people enough that come to these events where you know yeah. what what booth is gonna hit. <laughs> yeah. And and you know how to train a salesperson to do the outreach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how to price stuff. You know how to like. You know what yeah. I mean. You can have your own business within your business, right? Yeah. Um. But um. But yeah, I think um. I think with that being said, man, you know we're we're getting uh we're getting kind of close to the end here. <sighs> um. That's um, that you know this is like really really insightful right so where where is Culture Night Market gonna be you know in the next five years we're gonna be a traditional location I mean a traditional event similar to the San Jose Jazzes to the Sofa Street Markets to the um, to the music in the parks like we are the next tradition culture like we are the next traditional event in San Jose yeah um, that's based in San Jose but there will be activations all around California. Mm -hmm. um, we already did an event in Salinas a couple months ago. That was our first time going outside of the city and it had really great response. Um, we have discussions with people in Redwood City, um, Fremont, Gilroy, um, and eventually maybe we can go down uh, to Fresno and, and LA and stuff like that because this, at the end of the day, culture looks different in different places. So I feel like there is still room to represent those cultures in different cities and still execute 
on uplifting the people, uplifting the culture, and giving a, a place where group economics can thrive. You know what I'm saying? So that is the plan for Culture Night Market. It's gonna it's gonna happen. So when 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 are you gonna? Uh, has Culture Night Market hit the million dollar mark yet? Oh no, <laughs> we okay. still got some way to go. But it's okay. Though. I'm happy with that. I'm you, still happy. You, you know what? You know one thing that Mauricio like the the one thing that I, I learned on on that podcast. Yeah. Uh, that like blew my mind because yeah. I always thought that being a millionaire meant you have a million dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. And then when he said it, it when he said no, no, people get that confused. Oh yeah. Be being a millionaire means you, you know, like he's you, talking about revenue. Like if you actually generate that much money. Yeah, like that's you know. So like my my company, if I were to sell it, uh, it would sell for you know over four million, right? Yeah. So that's you know what I have in like assets, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So technically, I have a million. I don't feel yeah. like one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't feel like you know, like yeah. who, who wants to be a millionaire, all that. But then he was talking about like net worth. Yeah. Right. Net worth. Yeah. And having that million, um, and and that was like really enlightening. So when when do you think Culture Night Market will be a million dollar company, mm -hmm. and when do you think you'll have net million? Um, I think I would say like within within two years. You know what I mean? I, for, I, I, for I, just, I just feel like um, I'm more focused on just building the experience and like I think that will all come with it you know what I mean like I don't really measure success on monetary you know what I'm saying even though obviously every business person is paying attention to the numbers but I'm really basing it on like how people feel about culture night market and like because honestly like when I did a grant panel when we were submitting our grant um, it was it was uh, evaluated from a group of art commissioners and people in the city uh, council members all on a panel on a zoom call and it was like hella pressure because they're going through every single applicant and they're talking about the pros and cons of the event and they're talking about what they like about the event what it needs to improve on the application and they're like criticizing the fuck out of it sometimes it wasn't good right yeah and then when they got to culture night market they're like culture night market they were going through our score a, co a composite score we gave it a 75 percent which is really good because everyone was getting like 40s and 50s mm -hmm. and they were saying if you don't know about culture night market you're living under a rock <laughs> that's literally what they said out of their mouth so yeah. the fact that they think that tells me that the brand is already there like the brand recognition is already there yeah. I think it's just the success on the monetary side um, is yet to follow um, but I think it will be there um, it just takes a little more time um, because I seen you know like San Jose Jazz it takes them a million dollars to put together the whole event wow. so I mean if they're able to do that I mean, they've been around for like, you know, a couple of decades. Yeah. So I know it takes time. Yeah. Um, but I, like I said, I think. Um, yeah, well, eventually Culture Night Market will have a war chest, right? Eventually mm -hmm. you guys will have so much money stacked up. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and you'll be able to make moves like that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm inspired by other business models out there in California, like uh, uh, Patches and Pins Expo. They're based in L.A. And I've seen that they've created sub events under their brand. And mm -hmm. they have like the flea market brand. They have the Patches and Pins brand they have the hat brand and it's more like an urban event but they created different themes and now it's like become I don't, I don't I don't think monopoly is the right word but it becomes like a layer of businesses under one brand mm -hmm. so I'm working on another event I'm gonna late I'm gonna give the viewers that made it this far the insight I'm working on another event it's gonna be big and we're working on a big partnership with a with a developer out here in San Jose and it's gonna be called feast mode so it's gonna say culture night market feast, feast mode and it's feast mode like feast beast mode. Yeah. like beast mode but feast mode feast mode I like and that. basically it's gonna be um, an event with 10 to 15 food vendors only food vendors um, we're gonna have dining tables we're gonna have live entertainment and there's gonna be like workshops implemented on the experience but it's basically a food event and we're gonna bring like we're gonna try to work with like influencers like the foodies and shit like that and try to implement it all in one event but we're trying to do it like on a street closure yeah. Um, so yeah, it's in the works right now. I've been working on it for months. Hey, or organize uh, organize an event for your vendors, bro, so that we can teach them some shit. Like, yeah. I, I, I would, bro. I, I would love to coach the next shoe palace. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I would love to to be the coach of like the next big thing because we can we can equip them. Yeah. You know, to start thinking like about business, like start thinking past like this is not just a booth. This, yeah, it's a community know. at that point. Well, it, it's it's you know again like we talked about this last time. Shoe palace started at the flea market. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you know these guys figured out systems. They figured out processes. They figure, you know, they figure all these things out. You yeah. know what I mean? So, um, or organize that because I can come help uh, and teach. Um, you know, like Lolo can come help and teach. Like yeah. we can get multiple entrepreneurs to come help and teach and yeah. be like, hey guys, 
like do you have your website up yeah. do you have like your how are you keeping track of your databases mm -hmm. what are you guys doing for marketing mm -hmm. you know are your margins set correctly like yeah. how are you you know what i mean where in your business where are you spending your time yeah. who here even wants to be full-time yeah. you know what i mean like mm -hmm. shit, shit like that yeah like do you want to do you want to take this thing serious yeah. and turn it into a full-time business for sure or how are you doing your books how are you are you planning for taxes yeah. are you fucking you know what i mean mm -hmm. where are you sourcing your stuff are you still yeah. making it yourself because if you're if you're making your products yourself i you know dude we can go to vietnam we yeah can go to the philippines we can go mm -hmm. right so dude if you if you were to put that together i would be very happy to uh, yeah to to volunteer yeah it's definitely been on the agenda we were going to do it in the past we ended up trying to work with someone but they ended up running off without it without us so we just let it happen well, um, we just focused on us you just branded culture night market yeah. and just you know culture night market get like i don't know like Culture Night Market Workshop for yeah. vendors. You know what I mean, yeah, that, yeah. that could be another value add. Like yeah. when, when you when you come and vend with us, you grow with us, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And and that could be like a thing, right? And then testimonials and people will start being like, yeah, since since I started taking this and going, like my sales yeah. have gone up. Yep. You know, I was able to buy my baby a bike. No, yeah. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> you. no, I think it is necessary though because uh, yeah. there is a lot of uh, things that I, the vendor community can benefit from just learning how to like just properly approach their customers in, in yeah. the event itself and. Uh, managing systems and stuff like that. It's been game changing for me, so I can only imagine how it would be for them. Yeah, so with that being said, um, for those of you who don't already follow BQ, yep. how do they get a hold of you? Uh, follow me on Instagram at BQUUU. -U -U. Uh, you can follow me on uh, TikTok now. I'm on there, Yo Soy BQ. I'm on there. <laughs> Yo Soy uh, BQ. Yeah, I've, been, I've been putting my content on there a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. At Twitter, I think I'm LBQ408. LPQ. And then uh, for uh, YouTube, uh, Emlyn Exclusive. Make sure you guys follow Emlyn Exclusive, E M L N Exclusive. Follow any of bars. Because it ain't exclusive. Yeah, it ain't exclusive if it ain't an Emlyn Exclusive. That's just been the slogan since day one. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Well, I appreciate you hopping yeah, on. Yeah, hell yeah, bro. man. Nicole's, man. Nicole's yeah. finest, bro. Nicole's, let's go.